You're listening to episode 74 of Caucus Talk, your source for culture, history, and tourism in the North Caucasus Mountains of Russia. I'm your host, Eli, and I gotta say, I'm excited about today's episode. I, I know it could be said that Andrew and I are easily excited about our podcast, and that's true. We love it. But today's interview... I'm going to go out on a limb. I think this is kind of a once in a podcast kind of an interview. Our guest today embodies so much of what uh, we love about the Caucasus. She not only carries with her the deep historical rooting and connection through her family and amazing life story and story of her family, but she's forward looking and progressive and active. She is an American, Syrian, Circassian entrepreneur and media producer. Her interests range from film to music to skincare products, all rooted in her Circassian background. I'm going to let her speak for herself because she has a lot to say and it's really fascinating. Today's interview is split up into two episodes. I hope you'll listen to them both. They are not boring. We just couldn't be more privileged to welcome today's guest. So without further ado, episode 74. Welcoming to the Caucus Talk studio, Suhain Beck. Woo! Welcome from California. Whatever Thank the name you. of the state, we're really excited to have you. That's the, that's the state of the podcast. So there. Keep all that in there. <laughs> Way to go. All right. Suhain, it is awesome to finally have you on the show. This is going to be a good one. Everybody buckle your seatbelts. <laughs> There's energy emanating from the screen. So we're all in different places, as is our want, but you can just feel it. It's crackling across the lines. Yes. Well, I want to thank you both because you have no idea what it feels like for me as a Circassian in Southern California to discover this podcast, Caucus Talk, and then (laughs) to like hear two American guys, two like normal American guys go discover my land, my homeland, my culture, my community, all our cultural wow. traditions. It's been an emotional roller coaster, honestly. Like it really has been to listen to you discovering wow. my past. And wow. You know, growing up in America, it was really tough and lonely because we were invisible sure. and no one knew who we were. And for the longest time, it was. I'll tell you what, Suhain, I that's something I never thought of, like y- that I, angle of us discovering, I mean, it's very personal, like for us to discover a culture is one thing, but to have someone listening who's saying, that's my culture, that really means a lot. That make, makes me even more glad that we're still doing it. It meant a lot. <laughs> it meant a lot to me. I mean, I discovered them um, last summer in 2019. And I binge listened to every single episode for about a month (laughs) without exaggeration because I was so hungry to. My condolences. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, that really is a huge compliment. No, you really did. It it was amazing because you filled in a lot of blanks and you reaffirmed so many things back to me that. You know, I questioned along the way, you know, about my culture, about our hospitality, our generosity, and, you know, and. You know, I always question myself here in the United States because, you know, I'll go to somebody to somebody's house in America who's so sincere and they invited us over for dinner, but they'll be on the couch. The door is open and they're just motioning for us to come on in. Oh, and they're sitting no. American and they're hospitality. Sitting, and they're sitting uh, on the couch, but they went all out and they made us a steak and, you know, potatoes dinner and like, you know, full on, like they're honoring us. Yep. But they're so casual and sporty yep. about it. That we felt so awkward. And so to hear you, you know, really <laughs> grand, grandize like our, our culture, it's been amazing. Uh-huh. So I'm like, yes, that is wow. us. <laughs> That's very cool. Well, I think yeah. our listeners need to um, find out who you are. 
<laughs> first, right, Andrew? Well, Suhan, I got it. Let me intro to this. So uh, last June, uh, on our Facebook page, we get this. It was a review, actually. It was a, a review of our podcast, and this is what it said. Out of the blue, it said, uh, it's from Suhan. Great talks, fun interviews. See you soon in 2020. We're coming. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, who, what, who is this person? <laughs> who says that? <laughs> and then I just wrote a quick response. Oh, great to hear from you. Uh, you're coming here. Like, where are you from? And, uh, then in a series of messages, Suhan said, we need to talk. Then you posted a video of something you did about circassians in California. And you said, after you watch this, let's set up a conference call and discuss hint. It's big. Oh, <laughs> and then you wrote, oh, then you wrote man. immediately after that. Can you say snowball? Since airing this episode less than 48 hours ago, I've been inundated with interest about organizing a trip back. Yes. And I was just like, what is happening? Who is this person? No, not the <laughs> average response that we get, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're no, coming. I, I am guilty. I am guilty. Uh, um, yeah. No, I go, I go since, big. Yeah. And like we, you and I had a phone call pretty soon after that, Suhan, and uh, really just, I mean, you have for lack of a better word, an incredible story. Your family has an incredible story. Yeah. Um, so please, yeah, why don't you, you mentioned that you're Circassian in California, that you grew up in the U.S., but just share briefly kind of your story because your family too, like at some point generations back left the Caucasus. You've mm -hmm. been in multiple places. G give our listeners um, a bit of a brief background of who you are, your family okay. as well. Well, my my paternal grandfather, Dr. Muhammad Ali Bshahaluk, um, he was of the generation that was part of the exodus that left Khafqasia at the turn of the century and just before the turn of the century. So it was right after the 1864. And um, so he... Sorry, I'm going I'm so to interject. I'm, we're both yeah. interjecting. So Let's give can context. you differentiate between the exodus and the um, dis, uh, deportation? Deportation, I mean, thank you. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. yeah. Um, this was right after the 1864. So that okay. was the, so, the final surrender. Okay. You know, so that yeah, was right so around that same time. For those so of that's you who when are my unaware. grandfather's family, who was Abjadur, who came from a village, um, I think it's called Pshahlukwai. So it's named after my family. Nice. So uh -huh. my father, my grandfather actually had, you know, part of the, like the nobility, like they were very well known and, and it was, the, the, the village was named after my grandfather, uh -huh. you know, my grandfather's so heritage in the name. Um, and they were Abjadur. And so they left. My mother's side of the family is from Maikop and they're Abizakh. Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. um, so I'll focus on my grandfather's family. Um, so they ended up coming to Syria into the Golan Heights. They settled there. My grandfather studied medicine in Turkey. He was actually known as the Turkish doctor because he was so good that Turkey wanted to adopt him as one of their own. Nice. Huh. Wow. He, en he ended up marrying the um, daughter of, I think it was a very prominent um, Turkish person, like a sultan or something, like one of the last sultans. And they never had children. And then they ended up, um, she died and my grandfather hmm. inherited all of the land in Turkey, which huh. we've never accessed. So supposedly there's a whole thing there. Anyway, so we wow. ended up in the Golan Heights and my grandfather was a very well-known surgeon um, that was very, very well-educated, very, you know, much a scholar. And he was very much dedicated to the Circassian cause and worked on the vocabulary and compartmentalizing it um, into the different languages of Turkish and Arabic and Circassian. And he also knew German and Greek, I think, because he had six languages. Yeah, And wow. he wrote and published in three. So he was part of that whole group of the anthropology of Circassians and the linguistics of Circassians. And so it's really interesting wow. when I hear like John, you know, Dr. John Colarusso and his linguistic yes. theories, they coincide completely with what my grandfather's theories were as well. Oh, no that kidding. I had, that I had heard. Yeah. So the Euro-Asian 
Mm -hmm. um, the roots of the languages and whatnot. And so it's really just fascinating to hear that now after so many years, because I had heard my father tell me about that. So So, can I interject real quick? Yes. Let me give, let me give context for our our listeners uh, who aren't experts on Cox's history and geography. So uh, the Russia Caucasian war happened. It was a hundred year war. It was uh, mid 18th century through mid 19th century. It finished in 1864. And at that point, many Circassians were deported across the Black Sea to Turkey from Russia. So your family actually uh, stayed in, and the village your grandfather is from is from Adigea, is in Adigea. It's still there today. Uh, we communicated about this. Uh-huh. You mentioned two, there's, this is right, right? 13 Circassian tribes kind of under the Circassian flag and nation. Your grandfather was uh, Bjeduk, is that Bjeduk, right? Bjeduk, yeah, Bjeduk. Bjeduk, and that's, what, that's a smaller one you don't hear about often today. Right. And then your, your mother's side of the family was Abzak, is yes. that right? Yes, uh-huh, Abzak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, those are both tribes within the Circassian nation, nation. They both went to Turkey and then uh, went to Syria. Correct. And so just for our listeners, just so you know, today there are... There's a huge diaspora of Circassians in Turkey, several million from what I understand, and then also in Jordan, Syria, and in Israel. And all of that is the result of the Russia-Caucasus War, which culminated in many Circassians being deported into Turkey. Right. Yeah. So technically, we were refugees. And so Europe as well, all the way through, you know, what is known as Bosnia— um, the Slavic nations and the Middle East. So a lot of the Circassians ended up going through Europe, Turkey, and the Middle East. So we had oh. relatives, you know, throughout there that also settled. Um, I'll, I'll tell you the rest of the story. So we settled in the Golan Heights, which is the area in Syria, right? Um, it's a very beautiful, hilly, natural, agricultural, um, kind of a highlands um, between mm-hmm. Israel and Syria. And, you know, I can just imagine back then that the Circassians that were settling into the Middle East, they were seeing the desert area and they were seeing the flatlands and they were like, this is not a place. But the grasslands, like the the hills of the Golan yes. Heights, they were like, OK, these are not really mountains, but they're kind of hilly and we like hills mm-hmm. and mountains. So let's go right. settle there. So hmm. that's my own logic kicking in. So uh-huh. they settled there in the Golan Heights and they didn't realize that they were just kind of sandwiched between two basic, you know, factions between Israel and Syria. And then they realized, oh, that's why they put us here. (laughs) (laughs) Because they were the warriors, you know. And um, so my grandfather was a doctor. He was a surgeon and he was um, very well connected there. And he married um, Naji al-Asali, which she was very well connected with the Syrian um, government. Her brother was the vice president and the secretary of state of Syria as well. Hmm. And then um, the 1967 war happened. So that was the six day war. Mm -hmm. So both my grandparents, they had, you know, lots of land and they had the medical clinic there. And, you know, overnight they became refugees again. Hmm. And um, I know this one story that um, when the government wanted to take the, the Circassians out of the Golan Heights, basically, and house them in tents like refugees, just like, you know, the Bedouins and the Palestinians and whatnot, and put them as refugees. Um, my father, Nur Salam, um, basically said, no, Circassians will not reside in tents as refugees. Hmm. So he defended, you know, them to not be displaced in that mm-hmm. way. So he basically, um, you know, pulled his strings with um, another very prominent Circassian woman. Her name was Majid al-Mifti. And basically, they got them into a school. So each family had a classroom. Hmm. And they Hmm. basically were housed there and temporarily until they were able to assimilate and absorb into the city of Damascus and Aleppo and, and, and whatnot. So that was that. So that was 1967. And then thereafter... How, um, how long did that last? Do you know that they were in that limbo? And- three months, barely okay. three or four months, like uh, less than six months. And so they were okay. really able to transition back into the city and move uh-huh. you know, out of the Golan Heights permanently, which was very heartbreaking. 
that was a sure. very, you know, traumatic kind of a thing. My mother lost her brother in that war as well. And so, you know, it was very hard. Wow. Um, so from there, my father kind of had a feeling that, you know, the Middle East was not going to be stable because of, you know, the apparent nature of the Middle East. And he was worried about socialism. And, you know, long behold, 1971, the socialist Ba'ath regime took over in Syria. And so from oh. there, um, my dad had a very prominent position in the government, um, working at the Ministry of Information. So he knew that with all of the articles that he had written, pro-democracy, uh-huh. he would not be, you know, he would be the first ones to, you know, have, you know, the situation happen when the overthrow, when wow. the Ba'ath regime was going to take over. So he basically did, a, you know, middle of the night kind of a thing on a midnight train to Turkey. Oh. You know, let's let's get out through Turkey. And there was a funny story about that. My, you know, we were we were leaving through there at the last checkpoint stop. My family got caught on the train and we were pulled off of the train yeah. and taken into the officer's station. And the officer that was there kind of had his back turned. And, you know, my father, my mother, myself, I was a baby. And the officer was accusing my father of trying to escape the, the borrowed homeland that had been so gracious to us Circassians. Mm-hmm. Wow. And my father was like, no, 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 um, I'm just going uh, to, to Turkey because my son needs an eye operation or something, you know, medical. <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, um, you know, my dad was sweating bullets. He was like ready to oh, lose geez. it completely. The officer turns around and he goes, you're leaving without saying goodbye. Uh, and it turns out it was his college buddy. Oh my and gosh. So, oh my goodness. So they had a three hour rendezvous drinking <laughs> sausages, you know, meats and shawarma, <laughs> you name it, while the train was loaded with people waiting for us and my oh. father, you know, for them to have their last ruha. That's crazy. So next time you're on a train that's not moving, just think <laughs> what could be going on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, just real quick, you know, I want to say something that, um, you know, our, like my name, Beck, is actually a derivative of Pshahaluk. So when the Circassians were in Syria, there was this new mandate that was set. And it was as a result of so many Circassians coming in and all of us were considered foreigners with very difficult pronouncing, you know, names to pronounce. Sure. <laughs> And so the Syrian, yeah, the Syrian government was like, uh, this is, you know, kind of complicated. Why don't you just use the, the first name of your grandfather? So many Circassians, Uh, you'll notice that their last name is actually a first name, but used mm -hmm. as a last name. Uh, So it's a little bit confusing. So for example, um, like my grandfather's name was, um, Muhammad Ali Pshahaluk. So then they wanted my father's name to be Nur Salama Muhammad Ali. Uh-huh. Okay. So rather than keep the surname, the Pshahaluk, so what my father did was he filed a lawsuit against the government of Syria and said, <laughs> absolutely not, because <laughs> wow. we are Circassians, <laughs> we deserve our names, names right, right. And, and, you know, we are the last of the, you know, I don't want to say the last of the Mohicans, but basically the same parallel. You know, okay, the last yeah. of the Circassians. And so we deserve wow. to honor our name. And there is a specific law in the Islamic law, which is Sharia, which the Prophet Muhammad actually had said. If you adopt a child. You can't take not... away his surname. Thank you. Ian. That's that's excellent. Right. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. Right. Be- because, wow. um, you know, just in case there's a there's a chance of a brother and a sister potentially later that's finding right. themselves and being adopted from different families and then someday marrying each other. So there's a lot of wisdom Man. behind that. And so my father, who was a lawyer um, in Syria, he basically used the Islamic law against the Syrian government. Sure. <laughs> in order to create this sure, exclusion. Sure they this, love that. <laughs> yeah, this exclusionary loophole in order to do that. Because a lot of Circassian families ended up, you know, calling their, their last name by the f- first name of the grandfather. Mm-hmm. So we did that. And my father made sure, because he was the last male... <clears throat> The, male, the last male of the Pshahaluks that came out. Mm-hmm. So later in the story, I'll tell you how that served an amazing purpose. 
But anyway, <laughs> so we ended up going to Turkey for about 18 months um, at a camp there. And then we were lucky enough okay. through this program called the Tolstoy Foundation that helped sponsor a lot of the Circassians out to go to America legally. And so that's uh-huh. how we came to America. We ended up in New Jersey where there's a huge, huge, beautiful community of Circassians. Um, uh-huh. We spent 10 years there. We had probably the toughest um, immigration. I don't want to say immigration, but settlement there. And no. um, we came to America in the worst possible of times. It was 1971 mm-hmm. during the impeachment crisis of Nixon. And yep. it was the highest unemployment, the energy crisis, right. right? you know, extreme, extreme racism and, you know, wow. rejection of any, you know, foreign community and whatnot. So wow. it was an extremely difficult time. We grew up in Clifton, New Jersey. We mm-hmm. had gangs and mafias and, um, I think, Andrew, you saw my YouTube video about that oh, with my mother. Unreal story. Yeah. <laughs> we will just, I'm going to insert, we're going to link that in the show notes, listeners. But yeah. it's Suhain inter- interviewing her uh, mom uh, in Arabic. And then you can turn on the, sub- the closed captioning, the subtitles to get it in English. But like the story is unreal what your family went through. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, def- highly recommend watching that at some point. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was the first time my mother had ever opened up about that. So, even her brother and sisters, oh, wow. you know, uh, you know, in modern day, this was just a year ago that I opened that YouTube channel, and you mm. know, she for the first time opened up about what we had gone through, and our whole Circassian community reached out to us, and oh, Doctor Adil wow. Abdus Salam in um, in Syria called me to congratulate me and said congratulations, daughter, basically, he's, you know, he's Mm. not related to me, but he was a friend of my father. And he basically Mm. said, congratulations, daughter, you've proven how Circassian you are, even after all these years, because of the courage. (sighs) And that is the, the, the DNA claim that we have about being Circassians is the bravery and the courage that we have. And so, so it took a lot, like it was really a crazy, crazy, um, settle in, um, But it's kind of funny, you know, like a lot of the stories, I think, Andrew, you know, like we were just kind of like, yeah, it's normal, you know, and I think (laughs) that's the (laughs) Yeah, it's just another Wednesday. Like, you know, yeah, we had gangs and mafias and, you know, you know, constantly like the bullets and the bombs and they're killing our dogs and trying to arson our home and all of that. And, you know, my my father romanticized America so much that um, he was like, this is just like West Side Story. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but without the musical, looking at it i'm in a musical no, no. but without wow. the, but without the welcome to america <laughs> <laughs> oh don't get me started just don't get me started so i told uh, you i have no musical talent <laughs> i'm holding back no not that i just <laughs> <laughs> so so he he had a beautiful way of helping us adjust to, you know, the most difficult circumstances and a borrowed homeland, you know, like we really tried everything we could in Syria and then here in America as well to settle in. Mm. It's just, it's been difficult because we, we never really felt we could completely root ourselves in a hundred percent, you know, because we were, we had this amazing obsession, fascination with the homeland and there was always this romanticized feeling of, you know, going back and going back and wanting to keep the culture so desperately that, you know, it was not an option to not marry a Circassian. It was always an, op- you know, like it was always ingrained in us that we had to keep the culture as much as possible. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and we did, you know, we definitely did. Um, I, I think one of the, the interesting things is... Do we here in Southern California, do we speak Circassian? Do we, you know, keep the culture and the heritage? Right. And heck yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> you know, I mean, my mother speaks it fluently when, you know, whenever, whenever she gathers with her cousins, Ragda and the Huda and, you know, all of them, they're all speaking Circassian all the time. I understand it. Um, I struggle with my pronunciation and I'm very self-conscious about it, but I do understand it. Uh-huh. Um, wow. And, you know, I'm trying to relearn it all over again. But as far as the dancing, the culture, the art, the history, it, yeah, yeah, it's, it's you know, if I, I mean, I have a, a whole bookcase of books that, yeah. you know, I've been spending a good amount of this year also, you know, refreshing all of my information and, you know, and I'm going to be doing a TED Talk next year about, um, oh, in, to, in 2020, about, 
you know, the whole Circassian diaspora and, you know, all that we've wow. been through as well. So yeah, it's, it's just been, um, it's been difficult. And like I said, in the beginning, I so appreciate this podcast because listening to you as Americans, going back into my culture has just been so fulfilling and satisfying for me. And I'm not the only one. Um, I actually mm. heard about your podcast from my cousin, Samah, all right. um, uh. who, you know, is a judge and she told me about it. And I was like, what? Two American guys talking about us. <laughs> so do you have children? I do. I have a 28 year old girl and a 24 year old girl. So what does it look like for them? I'm curious in terms of preserving and passing on the culture. And I would add to that, like, I mean, let's start with your mom. She grew up in Syria, lived half her life there, has lived half her life in America. You've lived most of your life in America. Your daughters have lived their whole life. Like, what does that look like? Yeah, as far as identity, you know, Circassian, Syrian, American. <laughs> um, they definitely know their heritage. Um, I think that they need to go back and visit. And mm, to understand yeah. and honor it and really, you know, get more connected to it. You know, they know the, the, the structure, the infrastructure of their history, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, um, and they're hungry for knowing more. And I don't think that there has been enough um, media coverage for us of people going back there and doing that. And so, Andrew, this is what I was telling you in the beginning is like, we're coming, we're coming, <laughs> is that um, I had gotten so much motivation and inspiration from people that wanted to go and do a travel tour back to Kafkasia. Right. And they wanted to do it with someone who, you know, was American and right. that would be, you know, organized, that would be fun. That would be more outdoor act activities kind of a thing as well, like mountain uh -huh. climbing and, you know, that sure. kind of thing, because this new generation, that's what they want. So I had about 15 girls that really wanted to go there that are in that 20, you know, millennial age. Right. And my daughters and all of their cousins. And so all of us have been talking about coming back to Kafkasia to reconnect and, you know, rediscover yeah. our heritage and whatnot. Fortunately, I've been back and mm -hmm. I, yeah. you know, had a, a, a very, um, it just seems like a thousand years ago because it was in 1988. It was right after the Glasnost Perestroika mm -hmm. opening of the homeland. And we were one of the first families that was able to go back. And that was quite the experience. Let me tell you. <laughs> so yeah, wrapping up the kind of passing on of the culture, I was wondering what would you ideally hope for, for your children and their connection to their heritage? My dream was to actually come back to Kafkasia this summer, 2020, and um, do that tour with, with your tour group and to host that so that they can reconnect more tangibly rather than yeah. the way I grew up as well, that it was just kind of this romanticized ideals of our culture and our, our heritage and whatnot. But I really think that they have to go back to touch and feel and see the beauty and the awe and the magnificence of the land in order for them to appreciate it more. Sure. Mm -hmm. And if they were to see the culture there that they've maintained and they've held on so much, it'll incentivize them more for them to hold on to it more. Like it's really hard to hold on to this ghost now. Mm -hmm. And we're yeah. so far and distant. So my daughter got married last year and we had a whole Circassian jug and her um, Syrian American husband, he's Syrian, but basically he learned how to dance Circassian in order to, you know, you know, honor her as well. That's awesome. Yeah. And he did. And it was, That's it was great. so beautiful. It was a beautiful, you know, thing. So it was just a, a nice touch to include that and to make sure that it was there. Wow. So, yeah. So, I, I mean, I want them to experience what I experienced. And mine was like a spiritual pilgrimage. It was a hedge for me to go back yeah. to Kafkasia. And it was the, like so profound for me because, like I said, I had been obsessed. And as I was growing up, there were people that accused me of holding my Circassian heritage. How, how can I say this? Like, you walk through a door, but you're holding a big, wide stick, and you're trying to get through <laughs> the door, 
And that was my circassian heritage. And so when I was growing up, I was that person that was trying to walk through the door, but I'm holding a big wide stick that doesn't fit through the door. Mm -hmm. Wow. So somebody once accused me that and, and I was like, yeah, this is who I am and I am circassian and I'm going to do whatever I have to, to maintain it and hold on to it. So when I was lucky enough to go back with my family in, um, 1988, it was tough because on one hand, seeing the situation there at that mm -hmm. time, you know, the Circassians were kind of so like not stable either, you know, yeah. and that was hard to see. And there was no religion, you know, in that period of time, because it was right at the end of the communist era. So for like 65 right. years or so, they did not have religion. And that's something that the Circassians that were outside in the diaspora had so held on to, mm. you know, that they were able to reconnect with their dean and iman, whereas inside they were not allowed to at all express that. Interesting. And I remember one day, this was, I think I, I want to say Groznia, where there was a, a mosque that had been closed with chains on the doors for wow. that length of period of time. Oh and that day that we were there, it was the first day that that mosque was going to be opened. And there was a line of mostly older Circassian women who were all mm. like crying. It was like Hajj. They wanted mm. to be the first ones in. Mm. Wow. And they don't really know, they didn't know that much about Islam, but you can hear them say, Allah, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. You know, like mm -hmm. it was really mm -hmm. cute the way they were so <laughs> desperate that they huh. wanted to reconnect and they didn't know how, but they knew that they wanted it and they were hungry. So that was just a beautiful thing. It's really interesting. To, to experience. Mm. But I mean, I went up Jabal Elbros, Mount Elbros, and, you know, there was jugs and there was the, you know, the long dinners that you talk about your last episode. I, <laughs> you know, the long toasting that's seven hours worth of, you know, a dinner. <laughs> and, <laughs> but I, I have to say the most, incredible moment for us was when um, people from my grandfather's village from Shahalukwai heard that there was a group that had come in and that we were Shahaluk and they drove hours to meet mm, us. Wow. And when we found each other and we were so desperate to see, are they really related to us? Because we had been out in the wilderness of the world for so long yeah. that we didn't know that there was that connection and my grand and my father especially he didn't have any male relatives anywhere left he was wow. the last male shahaluk outside of Qafqasia. so the fact that he found somebody this is going to sound weird but we almost stripped down to compare body parts <laughs> 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 yeah, that almost sounds weird. <laughs> Look so, at those kneecaps. Those are I would recognize kneecaps. them anywhere. Absolutely. <laughs> Honestly, all it took was the feet. We have really uh, uh, macho, masculine, abshahaluk feet. And uh, till this day, uh, this is the signifying factor. And I think, you know, because, you know, abjadurs, you know, were known for being fierce. The fiercest of the warriors were the abjadur. Like that was very well known. The aggressive... And, you got a um, big feet for that. <laughs> so we literally were, you know, sitting in a very humble home and, you know, looking at our body parts and comparing. Oh and <laughs> that was our, you know, DNA testing, so to speak, of 1988. <laughs> hey, that works. <laughs> so uh, that's how hungry we were, you know, just to feel connected somehow. And that was a wow. really tough thing because here in America, we were invisible. No one knew us. And, you know, so much of our history has been deleted out of the books and the history and whatnot. And, you know, again, I'll say this podcast really meant the world hmm. to me. And we're going to hit pause on our interview there. There is more to come. Suhaina has a lot more to share. Please pick it up in the next one. Thank you for listening. And we'll see you when you get here. Nats divizam gwepen yak gwepen yak we show da kach hatri na khazna ga mu halad mu ajwi to gazira ho ira ira